Good morning. Isn't it wonderful when people still follow the Lord into the waters of baptism? Yeah, that's worth clapping for, I think so. So we're in a series called uh, There Is an I in Worship. It's a playoff of a phrase that says there is no I in team. And it's used to describe someone who thinks that their contribution is the only contribution that matters in a team. And one of the things about team sports is you have to realize everyone's contribution matters. When it comes to worship, our tendency is not to think that our contribution is the only one that matters. Our tendency is to think that our contribution doesn't matter at all. And so this morning, we're continuing in our series to talk about your contribution in worship is essential. It helps determine wins and losses, successes and failures. And so we want to talk about that this morning, and we're in Psalm 51, and this is what it says. Open my lips, Lord. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in, the sac in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. 143 years ago, a phrase appeared in a book. And the phrase, I'm sure you've heard it referred to, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. How many have heard that phrase? And it basically means that there's some subjectivity to beauty that someone might think something is beautiful and someone else might think that it is less than beautiful. So it kind of says beauty is subjective. And, but it, there's also this truth, is that there does seem to be some universal beauty, that across time and across cultures, people all agree that's a beautiful thing. If you've ever seen the Pieta, which is a, a, a stone statue of uh, Jesus just taken from the cross, being held by his mother Mary, and it's called the Pieta, and it, it, where you can see it is if you go to Rome, Italy, and you go to St. Peter's Church, it's, it's in that church. And people for hundreds and hundreds of years have lined up from everywhere in the world just to come see it. And, and I will tell you, I saw that, that amazing work of art. It's the single most impressive work of art I've ever seen. And I just couldn't get enough of looking at it. It's absolutely fascinating. So there does seem to be some things that are universally beautiful. So how about you? Are you universally beautiful? Well, if you like what you see when you look in the mirror, you might think, Yes, I, th I think this is, is not bad. In fact, it might be pretty good. And if you think that, take a picture and save it because uh, things are going to happen over time that you won't like, okay? But maybe you look in the mirror and all you see is all the things you would prefer to fix. You'd change the size of your nose. You would get rid of some wrinkles. You'd add hair. You'd change the color of hair. You'd do something with your facial structure. I guess that you can do just about anything now with cosmetic surgery. There are people who have jaw implants to make their jaws look better. Isn't that amazing? And so when we look in the mirror, if we don't like what we see, if somebody tells us that we're beautiful, we can be rather suspicious of their motives because we don't think that we are. Broken things seem to be less beautiful to us. And broken things seem to hold less value to us. And if something is broken, we usually try to avoid showing that brokenness. The passage that we read today was actually written by a man whose name was King David. He was the second king of Israel. And he wrote it at a time when he felt incredibly broken, and for good reason. 
He was at a season of his life when he was a little bit older, he was bored and he was restless. There was a military campaign that was going on in a faraway place. He was not involved with that. He was back at the palace. And so one night he couldn't sleep. He goes up on the roof to kind of get some fresh air and walk around and what he saw captured him. What he did fractured him. He saw a beautiful woman taking a bath, a woman without clothes, softly lit by the moonlight, and he wasn't bored anymore, but he was still restless. He wanted that woman, and so he had his servants go and bring her to him. What happened next is not hard for us to imagine. No doubt David thought it was a romantic evening. We have no idea what Bathsheba thought of that night. The only thing we do know that she said is that it wasn't too long after and she sent word to the king that she was pregnant. The reason why that's a specific particular problem is that she was married and her husband was away at that military campaign that David was not at. So everyone would know that this child could not be her husband's and that she had been unfaithful. David went into self-protection mode. It's what people do when they're at risk of being caught for a serious moral failure. So he sent for the woman's husband. His name is Uriah. And he asked him to come back from the military campaign and to bring news of how the battle was going. He said, I want to hear news and I want to hear it specifically from this person. And what he assumed is that when Uriah got home and delivered the news, that night before he headed out to go back to the, the battle, that he would spend the night with his wife. And then when she was announced to be pregnant, everyone would assume, well, that's how that happened. There was a problem with plan A. And the problem was is that Uriah didn't go home to Bathsheba. He slept on the porch of King David's palace. And David couldn't believe it and he says, why did you not go home and enjoy your wife? And, and this is what Uriah said. It wouldn't be right for me to go home and enjoy being with my wife when all of my friends and comrades in arms are putting their lives on the line and they have not been around their wife for a long time. And that just wouldn't seem fair to me. So kings are good at just coming up with plan Bs. And he came up with one. He said, well, just take another day, stay around. And uh, I may have some information I want you to, to send back with you. And so, and what he did is he invited Uriah to dinner and he got him drunk. And he thought for sure that resolve of his will fade under intoxication. And Uriah is drunk, but in the morning when they open the door to the palace, he's still on the front steps. And so not, none of his plans have worked. And so now he's got to go to plan C. And plan C was really devious. He sent an, a message back that Uriah would hold on to. It was sealed by the king. And it would go to his commanding officer and it said, I want you to put Uriah on the front lines at the most dangerous part of the battle. And when he is under assault, I want all of his friends and comrades to not support him in that and I want you to make sure that he dies. And all of that happened just as David said. Plan C went off as planned. And David brought the grieving widow to live in his home. He had covered his tracks, but he had fractured other things and other lives. There's a lot of brokenness in David. Have you ever looked into a broken mirror? It's a really strange thing to stare at. The image of yourself is still reflective, but it's actually distorted in some unique ways. Some of the angles of the glass are a little bit off because of the fracture, and then there are the actual lines in the fractures themselves. And, and some shards may actually be missing. And so while you can recognize that it is a reflection of you, it is in many ways distorted. It's not the kind of picture you would put up as your profile picture on social media. Here's what we need to know. We're not looking into a broken mirror. We are the broken mirror. 
We're not just looking at something that reflects back an untrue image of us. We were created in the image and the likeness of God. We were created to reflect Him. And every one of us have experienced brokenness. In some ways, that image is still recognizable, and we see moments of it. But it's also distorted by things that have been done to us and broken us, or things done by us and broken us. And to complicate matters, not only are we a mirror, we're a two-way mirror, which means that we actually are looking through a distorted lens into the world around us. To be sure, the brokenness that we see is real, but it's different than we actually see because we're looking through a broken lens. We don't see the brokenness of others as clearly as we think we do. So King David had covered his tracks, but he did not fix all the things that he had broken. He took what he wanted. He took the woman he wanted, and he took a life. And he thought he got what he wanted. But there was a lot of brokenness that that created. Now, of course, his brokenness is obvious, and it's the stuff that still makes the headlines when a famous person commits it. What's less obvious is our own brokenness. We don't see it as clearly. So let's start with this truth this morning. Everyone is broken. Everyone is broken. We were born broken, and we were born into a broken world. We have done things that have broken us, and we've had things done to us that have broken us. And the sad news is, is that once you're broken, you can still be rebroken. The shards just get smaller and the reflection a little harder to see. The distortion becomes greater. They're more pronounced. And we don't want anybody looking at that too closely. Here's the second thing that's true is while everyone is broken, broken people can still worship. Broken people can still worship. This isn't a statement that indicates that our brokenness doesn't matter. It's not a way of saying it's business as usual, that even if you're broken, just go on like everything is okay. King David's song isn't about avoiding accountability or responsibility. It isn't about hiding. It is about healing. And that's the point regarding our brokenness. It is about healing. Now, this creates a dilemma because in God's presence, our brokenness is obvious. When we come into the presence of God, we become more aware of our brokenness. We see all those missing pieces. We see those lines more clearly. And this is what happened to David. There was a prophet that came to talk to David. His name was Nathan. And he came and he brought the presence of God with him. Nathan told King David a fictional story, a parable about an injustice that was done. And when David heard the story, he was offended that a person would act in that way. And he said, that person should be punished for their actions. And Nathan looked at him and said, you are the man. You are the man. The curtains were no longer drawn. The mirror is no longer face down. Because of God's presence, David could see God again, and David could see himself again. And this is the main reason, this is the main reason people avoid God. It is not because God is boring. Our culture is perfectly content with any God that is boring. They have a real problem with a God who is real and reveals what is true. And so David brings the presence of God, or Nathan brings the presence of God to David. There's another man in Scripture. You can find his story in, in Acts chapter, or not Acts, but Isaiah chapter 6. And his name is Isaiah, and he finds himself in the presence of God. He has one of these supernatural experiences where he's literally in the throne room of God. And the things he sees there are quite astounding, and he describes them as best he can. But what's interesting is that when he sees God for who he is, he sees himself for who he is. And so when he described it this way, he said, I am ruined. I am falling apart. 
And then he identifies the specific thing that stands out, the most obvious missing shard, the most ob uh, obvious fractured thing in his life. And he said, I am a person of unclean lips. I have said things that, that are corrupt. Even though I wanted to be a voice for God, the way I went about it didn't represent God. It represented me and it burdened people. And the way I went about that was not right. And then he says, and I'm from a people of unclean lips. We've all used our speech in way that has been destructive. He isn't comparing himself to God. That's not what's happening here. He's seeing his own brokenness in the presence of God. And he uses a word, woe is me, woe. If you come from Jewish background, the word is oive, woe is me. And it means basically two things. And the first is this, it means deep sorrow. A person who goes through great woe would be deep sorrow, but there's also the, another way we use that word is back in the days when people rode horses. Anybody ever been on a horse? Not many. Uh, if you've ever been on a horse, the universal word to stop a horse is, you know it, sir. It, even if you haven't ridden a horse, you are already trained. Like if you've, it, that horse stopping can be a really important thing. You say, whoa. And and what happens is in the presence of God, we see ourselves and it causes great sorrow and it paralyzes us. We can't move forward. Woe is me. I'm falling apart. In God's presence, not only is our brokenness obvious, our brokenness is healed. God instructed an angelic creature to go and take coals off of the altar and touch Isaiah's lips and in so doing, healed him of the, the corruption that had come from his lips. See, it isn't about hiding. It isn't about trying harder. God is committed to more than your survival. Please hear what I'm about to say. This is important. God is committed to more than your survival. He's committed to more than just redeeming you. He's committed to restoring back to you everything that has been lost through the brokenness of a sinful world and the brokenness of our own sinful lives. How many are grateful this morning that God is committed to our restoration of all that he intends in our lives? It's absolutely true. Our brokenness is healed in worship. Our brokenness is healed in worship. When we engage in worship, we actually see God differently. We don't see him as some kind of judgmental tyrant whose intention is to drive all joy and pleasure out of our lives. We see him as a lovingly heavenly father. We also see others differently, not just their flaws. It's easy to see what's wrong in other people. It's more challenging to see their potential. But once we begin to be healed as we worship God, we begin to see others differently and we see ourselves differently, not as pretenders to a faith, but as living sons and daughters of a living God. That's what happens when we worship. So here's a hard truth. We cannot fix our own brokenness. We can't do it. All the shards of the broken mirror may be in place, but the image is still distorted. Some pieces may be missing. Maybe they were stolen. Maybe they've been thrown away. And we don't rightly reflect God. Looking at ourselves in a mirror until we get used to what we see is not the same thing as being healed. And looking at the reflection of others doesn't bring healing either. We, we see celebrities and people of renown in our culture and we look to them and we're so impressed by their looks or their abilities or their resources or their opportunities. And, and we think that if we, if we watch them long enough, somehow we'll feel better about ourselves. That's actually not how it works. We can't look at ourselves and bring healing and we can't look at others and bring healing. The only way, the only way we experience healing is when we look to God. Worship is not just a thought that we think and it's not just a truth that we hold on to. Worship is how we respond to that truth. Worship is an action and that's how we access healing. He says, well, that's, that's not my personality. 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's true. Um, I won't ask anybody here if you've ever played the lottery. But how many, if you played the lottery, and you looked at the numbers, and you looked at the numbers, and you looked at the numbers, and you looked at the numbers. And you looked at the numbers. <gasps> Wait, I gotta check and make sure that's all. <gasps> and then what would you do? Would you just put it in your pocket and go, eh. oh no. Even the most shyest and reserved of you would act in an embarrassing way. You would scream to the top of your lungs. You would call your family into the room. All of your debts would be resolved. All of the things that you desired to purchase would now be a possibility. Your children could go to whatever school they want. You could live wherever you want. You could travel to wherever you want. Your life is completely, we won the lottery. Yes. You are clearly not happy that I won the lottery. If I actually won the lottery, you would be very happy, and some of it for suspicious motive. I'm so happy for you. Maybe you will share it with me. Right? It's what we do. <coughs> Worship is not just looking and seeing who God is. It's responding. He is good. He is merciful. He is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. He is loving. He is powerful, and so many more things. And as we begin to acknowledge that in his presence, the fractured lines begin to come together. And as we begin to acknowledge that in his presence, the pieces that are missing begin to be replaced. And we start accurately reflecting who God is because we're actually in his presence and we're responding to him. Don't hide your brokenness from him. Bring your brokenness to him. Now, what's absolutely fascinating is there's only one human being that wasn't broken, and that's Jesus. He perfectly reflected the image of God in everything he said and in everything he did. And surprisingly, people were not repelled by that. They didn't run away from him. They were actually attracted to him. And it's because they saw all of him, not just a part of him. And what they saw is not only is he holy and not only is he perfect, but he's a healer. He's a redeemer. He's a restorer. And when I get around him, the fractured lines and the missing pieces are healed and they are replaced. The one who was unbroken became broken for us. He even told his disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. The Son of God was willing to take on brokenness so that we would not be broken any longer. Worship of the living God helps you see him more clearly. Worship of the living God helps you see yourself more clearly. You see your past differently. Now instead of just something that is shameful or something that is painful, you see how God can redeem that and God can restore you through that. I'm going to have the worship team come out. Um, this morning's baptism is actually the second baptism I've done in the last 24 hours. There was another person who very much wanted to be here. Um, she's facing the kind of health challenges that, well, none of us would want to face. And outside of a miracle, there isn't any hope. And so we had set up and gone to some rather extraordinary measures to, to be able to have her here. And I got a call on Friday and she was in the hospital and she can't get out. And she said, could you do a baptism here? And I said, yes, absolutely. And so I called the hospital Saturday morning 
And I said, told him what my name was and what my role is in our church. And I said, one of our congregants is in the hospital and things aren't good. And she wants to be baptized. How can we make this happen? And where she is, only two people were allowed in the room. And I said, she would like all of her children to be there and her husband and me. What options do we have? And because it's a Saturday, there's not as many people who can weigh in on that in the hospital. And so we went phone call to phone call to phone call until finally we got someone on the floor. And they asked me, they said, how long will this take? I said, about 15 minutes. And so they said, okay. I said, how about one o'clock? They said, yes, one o'clock. You've got 15 minutes. Whoever wants in the room can be in the room. And so I called the family and let them know, and they started scrambling to get everybody ready. And uh, it's a little hard for me to, to tell this story. So I, I walked into the room, and she surprised me because I'd seen her just two days before that, and, and her frame was so weak that she had to be carried, and her voice was so weak that she could only whisper it. Now she's propped up in a bed, and... And, uh, but when she talked, she had a voice. And I said, it is so good to hear your voice. I said, you sound strong today. And she had music playing out in the background. They didn't want to use just the, the speakers of a little smart device. So they'd actually hooked up a little speaker behind her bed. And she was singing along with the song. And the song was, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. There's another refrain to that song and it says, it may look like I am surrounded, but I am surrounded by you. And there she is in, in a hospital bed with the worst possible diagnosis that you can imagine. And we're just waiting for her family to get in. And this is what she's singing to the top of the voice that she had. And so family finally gathered in the room. And so I baptized her. And what I can tell you is there wasn't a dry eye in the room. If you've never seen how I do a baptism when I don't have an option of a tank, I took some water and I sprinkled it on her feet. I said, I baptize you in the name of the Father who will guide and direct your steps in all the paths that you should go. And then I sprinkled some water on her hands and I said, I baptize you in the name of the Son who holds you in the hollow of his hand and he will never let you go. And then I sprinkled water on her head and I said, I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit who grants unto you the assurance of your salvation. You are a daughter of God. And then there was another kind of baptism that took place in the room. Every one of us, just tears rolled out her face. Her hands were in the air and she was just, to the best of her ability, giving praise to God. And here's what I will tell you. Our tears were not because we felt bad. That would be an easy assumption to make, but it would be wrong. Our tears were for a different reason. In the midst of the worst kind of brokenness that you could possibly imagine and would avoid at all possible cost, we saw something beautiful. That's the point. In the midst of the worship, in the presence of God, something of beauty was seen for what it was. So I'm gonna ask us to stand to our feet this morning. And I'm gonna ask you to come into the presence of God. I don't know what brokenness exists in your life. And I don't know what brokenness exists in your family. I have some idea of the brokenness that exists in our world. But what I can tell you is staring at yourself will not fix it. And looking to others will not fix it. But if we can come in and we can focus on the one who is broken for us, he can heal us. So let's lift our hands and let's lift our voices and let's focus on Jesus, the author, the healer, and the finisher of our faith.